Number 10, Overshadowed and the Beard. Hatshepsut for a long while was content to play the supporting role among Egypt's royals, but when she decided she wasn't anymore, things took a turn. She was the daughter of Thutmose I and wife slash sister to her half brother Thutmose II. I know, don't worry, I'll address it later in the video, stay tuned. When he died in 1479 BC and left their son as heir, she took on the role as regent to Thutmose III, but she basically just acted as the rightful ruler. As the young king came of age finally, she declared herself pharaoh. The strangest part was that she chose to portray herself in pictures as a man with a male body and a false beard. She said that the god Amun was her father and insisted that he commanded her to take charge of Egypt. Who's gonna argue with a god, right? But no one could quite explain the issue with the beard. Nevertheless, during her reign, it was a time of peace and prosperity for Egypt. Number 9, Sesostris. Sesostris was one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, who was celebrated for the extent of his conquests. He stretched the kingdom further than anyone before him, but he was not without his quirks. According to accounts by Herodotus, Sesostris left pillars on every battlefield. Along with the usual bragging and boasting of how he won, he would carve into them images of genitalia, like people do on the bathroom stalls, you know? If he thought that his enemy fought valiantly, he carved a If he thought they didn't put much of a fight, he would carve a Great. Yeah, that just goes to show what he thought about things, huh. The latter was a sign of disrespect for his subdued enemies, while the other was a sign of honor, like, hey man, you stuck it to me. Apparently, some even stood the test of time, lasting over 1500 years, and seen firsthand by Herodotus himself. For those of you who don't know, for reference, Herodotus is considered as the father of historians, one of the very first to take up the task. Number eight, ceremonial seating. The whole idea behind the pharaohs was that they were direct descendants from the gods themselves. Therefore, they too had deific powers and had the capability of restoring life to the land. The Nile River had significant importance to the people of Egypt. It provided fertile soil and water irrigation. It was pretty awesome. In order to ensure its abundance would continue, pharaohs would organize a festival where they would ceremoniously fill it with their seed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Some historians believe that this was in honor of the creation story of how life came to be and therefore it was kind of like a fertility festival. Crowds would gather at the Nile and await the arrival of their pharaoh. They would then disrobe and give their pleasure into the river to ensure its bounty. Some historians say it was just the pharaoh who did this while others say that the men joined in after. Evidence still remains pretty slim as to whether this really did happen so take this one with a grain of salt but that's not to say that there isn't any evidence at all that it did happen, so there. Number seven, deliver me naked. Cleopatra is known as one of the most beautiful women in history, but this could be due to how she used her feminine wiles to get what she wanted. Her beauty and cunning became renowned as a result. While other queens like the one I mentioned before concealed their beauty, Cleopatra was all about Showing it off, cause girl, if you got it, flaunt it. In order to help secure the political ally and power connected to Caesar, Cleopatra knew how to make an entrance and knew how to win over a guy. It's, it's pretty easy. He was around 52 when they met and the Egyptian queen was just like 20 and in her prime, so. She looked great. She smuggled herself into Alexandria where Caesar was staying, had her servant tie her up in a bed sack, naked, and carried indoors to Caesar and she was like, have at her, buddy. In other words, she wrapped her naked body in a carpet, made Caesar's jaw drop to the floor, and secured one of the most beneficial unions on the spot. Honestly, not really messed up. Kind of badass. Honestly, just do your thing. Work it, girl. I dream of having that confidence with my clothes on. You know what I mean? Go, girl. You got this. You get that empire. Number six. Cats and the Battle. Ancient Egypt would have welcomed the film the adaptation of Cats, unlike the rest of the world, with open arms and probably would have built a shrine to it. Giant human cats eating human cockroaches would be revered. Bottom line, cats in ancient Egypt were worshipped and treated like family. It was considered a crime punishable by death to harm one due to the belief in the goddess Bastet. One pharaoh even risked losing a battle because of cats themselves. The Battle of Pelusium of 525 
Gizi between Pharaoh Samek III and the Persian king Cambyses II resulted in the first Persian conquest of Egypt all because of cats. Cambyses took advantage of the cat loving side of Egypt and used hostages of cats and animals as leverage. So they were just kind of like, well we can't we can't fight if the cats are let loose. What are we going to do? We can't kill the cats. And that's that's uh, how they lost that battle. Number five, fake beards. I can't grow a beard, so maybe I'll just start rocking the, the fake one, you know, like Hatshepsut. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. The pharaoh, fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was all done as an act of politics. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose III, and he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this bearded pharaoh that we're pretty sure we figured out. Number four, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with uh, an interesting method on getting rid of those pimples, that's for sure. Remind you, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, so... Again, creative. Physicians back then discussed pimples as these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin from four to five years. And by squeezing these spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots in there. I don't know. I'd be sick. See ya, now we're single. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. Hey, if a physician ever told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses on my persons, I would faint. That's the scariest news. I've ever heard in my life. That's some bad news, man. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah. Oh, you have acne? Hmm. Are you sure you're not turning into a bird? Maybe it's that. Come back next week. Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne, hopefully. Sorry, maggots, not acne. Maggots. All to get rid of maggots. I'm gonna go throw up. Number three, prosthetics. The ancient Egyptians were a culture of firsts and some of their achievements we still have no idea how they were able to accomplish. Like the pyramids? I couldn't tell you. Could you? Didn't think so. Hit that thumbs up. We're both wrong. We're both learning. It's very likely that some of the first ever prosthetics were used in ancient Egypt. How fascinating. Imagine being the first guy to make a toe, a fake toe. A female mummy who was discovered near Luxor had her death dated somewhere between 950 and 710 BCE. And she was also found with a prosthetic toe made from wood and leather on her person. While this, of course, is a wonderful cosmetic replacement, and it's no secret that the ancient Egyptians certainly valued aesthetics, it seems as though this prosthetic toe was completely functional and was actually used to help this woman walk. The toe, after it was discovered, had significant signs of wear and tear, which then inspired experts to start a study, look a little further. And they did. So they took participants and tested their gait, both with and without the use of a replicated toe. And in ancient Egypt, the common footwear were sandals, and walking in them would have been uh, next to impossible without a big toe. So it was clear that this prosthetic was very helpful and important to those similar to this Luxor mummy. Not exactly a beauty practice, but I'm sure they also felt a little more confident with that toe. This is also too impressive to exclude. Beauty list. I'm like, yeah, toes are beautiful. Why not? Throw them on. Number two, henna. I got henna done a few years ago and I totally blanked. I forgot that it lasted longer than like two days. I was like, day four, I'm like, what's going on, man? Is this permanent? While on one hand, pun intended, it is beautiful, ancient Egyptians' use of henna went beyond style and beyond imaging oneself after the gods. See, henna also has cooling effects on the body and ancient Egypt was, uh, was quite hot. It was used by ancient Egyptians to color their hair and fingernails and shades of red and orange. Now this shade, this exact shade, also provided comfort on hot days. Come back with some henna. Kind of nice. It lasts longer than a few days though, just so you know, if you want to get henna. It's important to know. That guy did not tell me in Greece. No, he did not. And finally, number one, deodorant. When it comes to deodorant, today we listen to the old spice guy. He's always whistling about something new. But long before he was born, ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs for deodorant. They made perfumes and oils, this is commonly known, but they were also the first to use any type of deodorant deodorant, like underarm deodorant. It was so impressive. Ostrich eggs mixed with a little fat and tamarisk and tortoise shell and then nuts, mix them all together and bam, there you go. You're ready for date night. Just apply all of that on your body. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. See, Egyptians would also use porridge balls. How creative is that? Flavored porridge rolled up and safely tucked in in your underarm right there, right there on your little smelly chicken wing. This morning I had some deodorant just crumble apart when I was applying it. You ever have that happen? Turns to fetish cheese all of a sudden, mid-application. Now my bathroom sink looks like a Greek salad. It smells great, but 
not practical. Might have to go back to the porridge ball method. Who knows? Maybe I have one right now. Maybe that's why I haven't moved this arm the whole time. Who knows? Kicking off the list at number 10, got a passport. Ramses II is known as one of the greatest ancient Egyptian rulers of all time. He was called Ramses the Great, so that's a good sign already. At a young age, he fought in harsh battles to protect the borders of Egypt, and during his reign, the Egyptian army reached 100,000 men. That's a pretty large army. He was later referred to as the Great Ancestor, and it didn't take long for Ramses II to declare himself a god. It's always fun being like, hey, by the way, I'm a god now. That's how cool I am. 30 years into his ruling, Ramses was ritually turned into an Egyptian god. It was a formal thing. Though it wasn't until 3,000 years later until Ramses would truly soar through the skies. He was buried in his treasure after 96 years of living, and in 1974, he finally started to show signs of aging. Not too bad. He went from being on display to being sent to Paris to get a glow up, you know, to preserve the king's body even longer. Instead of being listed as luggage on the way to Paris, the pharaoh was given an official Egyptian passport for the commute. The government gave a mummy a passport. This is like the first five minutes of a horror film. Under occupation, it even said king. And there was even a small disclaimer noting that he was in fact still dead. You can never be too sure, you know? Number nine, baboon tattoos. Ancient Egyptians worshiped animals. This is common knowledge now at this point. We've heard about their love towards cats, which I'll explain later on, but what about baboons? Yeah, they were pretty important pieces to this ancient puzzle as well. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. Now, one of the most strange things that pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Imagine stealing a pair for your family and then four baboons start doing parkour, chasing you down. That's so alarming. I would just throw it and be like, please stop. You're so scary and strong. They train baboons to pick fruit. They train them to make beer and they also train them to entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party. Their dance moves alone would be reason enough to tattoo one on my arms. You know what? I get it. Get a Harabe tattoo. I'm like, you know, I, it's, I, I see it. I see the similarities. Number eight, worship dung beetles. So worshiping a baboon that dances and makes holiday ales, yeah, I can see how one would worship such a creature. That makes sense. But pharaohs also worship dung beetles and their reasoning may surprise you. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way naturally. Animals are born with natural instincts. Sea turtles race to the sea. These guys follow the cosmos. It's pretty wild. It's one thing to follow the sun naturally because it gives off warmth. Sunflowers will literally turn their head to find the sun, which is super creepy, but it's beautiful. These insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their poop towards it. They'd be like, hello Milky Way, and they just... Hieroglyphs of these beetles are seen all over. Like near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, for example, there's a massive scarab monument. And today, if you walk around it nine times, you get good luck. And don't worry, you don't have to roll any droppings at the same time. Don't get dizzy, that's all, it's the only rule. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which ancient Egyptians believed was the sun. I grew up thinking the sun was a baby, but that's because I watched Teletubbies, so, you know, depends. Number seven, surprise each other. Cleopatra and Julius Caesar were a pretty beneficial couple, to say the least. Cleopatra would use Caesar's armies, which in turn would allow her to rule Egypt, while Caesar was eyeing down Cleopatra's extreme wealth. They were the perfect pair. She was able to financially support Caesar enough for him to return to power back in Rome, but how did such a perfect pair meet in the first place? Did Cleopatra swipe right? Hmm, no. Well, a then 52-year-old Julius Caesar visited the much younger Cleopatra, so she then sent a surprise gift to his chambers. She got her crew to roll her up in a carpet or bed sheets, it's not really confirmed, something along those lines, and then delivered her to his door completely nude. He unraveled a naked Cleopatra, and he's like, okay, hello. That's pretty impressive. Cleopatra was down for fun surprises. While we don't recommend this as an approach ever, it's one worth mentioning on our list. Number six, gender reveal parties. We've all seen those videos. A guy goes to hit a baseball, he misses it, the baseball breaks and there's pink dust all around his feet and he starts crying, it's wonderful. Gender reveal parties were quite popular, you know, until they started lighting wildfires. But back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. Instead of peeing on a pregnancy test, you would have to use wheat and barley seeds instead. 
Depending on how those barley crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. They were right 85% of the time, which is quite impressive back in the day. We went from watering crops to burning them. Hashtag, it's a boy. And speaking of, after that unification happened, it paved the way for the royal trendsetter Narmer. Because before our boy Narmer came along, the red crown of Lower Egypt and the white crown of Upper Egypt were worn by the pre-dynastic kings. Narmer was famously the first king to be portrayed wearing both crowns, symbolizing that union. This would later be replaced with the striped crown, a continuous representation of union called a nemesis. Adorning the top was the uraeus, an upright cobra that symbolized the ancient Egyptian goddess Wajet, meaning the pharaoh was ready to strike his enemies with deadly venom. Trendsetter Narmer doesn't stop at crowns, he's the first ruler to portray themselves in a royal beard, which every Egyptian pharaoh wore afterwards, whether man or woman. Then there's Narmer's implementation of an official who has the most important task of carrying the pharaoh's magic sandals. Egyptian pharaoh's sandals were the only piece of clothing that separated them from the land of Egypt and rightfully symbolized the union between the heavenly god world and the earthly human world. King Tut's sandals were famously inscribed with pictures of his enemies, meaning with every step he was crushing the enemies of Egypt. In the famous Narmer palette, he's also seen wearing a fake bull tail which symbolized strength to rule the country of the Nile, but that trend didn't stick. Hey, so Ramses has 50 lost daughters. What a crappy dad, doesn't know where all his kids even are. Kind of understandable when you have 102 of them with about 9 women however. Made possible by somehow living to be 91 in an age where people died at like 20. Suffice to say he had lots of leisure time. Of course, not all the children were children at the same time. Ramses II began his family long before he took over as king and he reigned for 66 years. He spread the brood out over most of that time. So archaeologists announced in 1820 they uncovered a tomb built by Ramses and that 52 or so of his sons happened to be in it. They finally recently started excavations after a few decades and now we know that the mausoleum is the largest and most complex found to date in Egypt's Valley of the Kings, with at least 62 rooms. But Egyptian kings normally didn't build mausoleums for their offsprings. Their principal wives, yes, over in the Valley of Queens, but their kids, no. If it turns out that only Ramesses sons are in the tomb, where are the 50 daughters? Sexism can answer that. Males were regarded as potential heirs to the throne and the princesses were not, so they weren't held in high esteem and didn't get a fancy resting place. Doesn't mean they didn't have value. Ramesses designated at least three of his daughters as princess queens. Woo! No? No. Oh, no. What that suggests isn't pretty. But what isn't known is whether or not they were actually married to him and, you know, producing, or if the title was a way of honoring selected daughters from tertiary wives. Historians, however, are pretty confident on which one it is. This would be the end of the story, but for a single question. Why would a latex protection manufacturer name its product for a man who had 102 kids? Are you choosing cats or your empire? In Egypt, the penalty for killing a cat was death. This was wasn't just a law against cruelty to animals or sadistic Friday the 13th butchery. All you had to do was accidentally run over a cat with your chariot and you're done. This is mostly due to the animal being closely linked with the cat-headed goddess of warfare and balls of twine, Bastet. They were also revered for the role they played in protecting food stores and homes from disease by killing pests like snakes and rats. Basically, pharaohs coined the three laws of robotics a millennia before Asimov and used them to protect the thing that poops under the stairs. And I, I don't think there are exceptions. One writer did Doris Siculus even recorded that the king of Egypt himself personally tried to intervene and save a Roman man who had accidentally killed a cat. His people did not give a single F, however, ignored the ruler, showed no mercy, caring literally negative a thousand if it meant risking war with Rome. They formed a mob, hung him, and left his body in the streets while the pharaoh sent a real awkward fruit basket apology to Rome. Perhaps the greatest example of a pharaoh placing the well-being of cats above that of his own people, however, was Pharaoh Pismatic III literally told his army not to fight the Persians' advancement because these smart little twists had painted the image of Bastet on their shields and marched behind a line of dogs, sheep, and cats. In their words, whatever animals the Egyptians hold dear. The Egyptians, under threat of death from the pharaoh, had no choice but to let the Persian ruler walk straight into the city unchecked. He then murked anyone who dared to challenge him, using the shields with cats drawn on them because you can't even strike an image of a cat in ancient Egypt. Cambyses, the ruler's name, celebrated in a dignified noble fashion, marching the Egyptian armies past him as he threw cats at them and screamed in at their gods. We aren't 100% sure who the first pharaoh was, but it was probably Catfish Chisel. The only way we know the lineage for early Egyptian kinship is the highly damaged Palermo Stone, which was a black slab of granite carved full of the names of kings up to the 5th dynasty. The part of the stone where the 1st and 2nd king of the 1st dynasty is inscribed is but
lots to clean off. Although it is generally accepted that the first king was Narmer, aka Menes. The second one was Aha. Even without enough evidence to prove beyond a doubt, I can't get past the Aha thing. The name of Narmer is composed to two ideograms. The catfish reading as Nar and the chisel reading as Mer. The location of Narmer's body has eluded archaeologists for two centuries now. The first Egyptian pharaohs used to build a type of tomb called a Mabasta, and they did so until the third dynasty when they started busting out pyramids. It's theorized Narmer is in one of those. But then Egyptologists have discovered a large field of pre-dynastic and early dynastic royal tombs in Umm al-Kab, and the Narmer's name is identified in an inscription found. However, this is Egypt. The site had suffered disturbances, tomb robbing, and disrest for the past 5,000 years, making it impossible to know which one of the bodies is the precise tomb of Narmer. To this day, archaeologists and Egyptologists disagree on whether Narmer was buried in Saqqara or Umm al kab and in the end, his cause of death isn't even fully known. Just that of a philosopher in Mantheo saying the reign of Narmer ends when he was carried off by a hippopotamus and perished. And last but not least, believe my eyes, even though it may be a lie. Who knows, I don't, but I love a good rhyme. While it was likely a disease genetically inherited in its DNA, the official Egyptian story is that Pharaohs was cursed by the gods with blindness. Apparently, when the Nile was flooding, Pharaohs got fed up with it, and instead of letting the water do its thing and calm down, he chucked a spear at it. Because yes, throwing a spear at a river would probably change things. For his insolence and stupidity, the gods struck his ass Pharaoh's vibes this way the best he can for 10 years before he meets an oracle that either wanted to pull history's most hilariously mean prank or genuinely believed the gods had passed on this message. But the oracle tells Pharaoh's all he's got to do is wash his eyes with the urine of a woman who's never slept with any other person than her husband her whole life. Okay. Well, Pharaoh's isn't asking questions, he's here for solutions. He finds his wife and says, babe, I want to spice things up in the bedroom, I have an idea. And the two of them give it a try. Only it doesn't work. So now he's still blind, and his wife has some explaining to do. Before she does that though, Pharaoh's needs some more urine and he needed it now. So every woman in town is gathered up and given a pot, which he then sat there, dumping its contents into his eyes, one after each other. No, I don't know if he waited for it to cool down. I do know it was probably the color of French's mustard though, seeing as Egyptians literally only drank warm beer. So so imagine. But somehow Pharaoh's finds the one who's not cheating on her husband or hadn't banged someone before getting married, and one of these warm beer pee buckets works. And I wish I was kidding, but the official Egyptian records say, yeah, magic pees did this. His sight is back, and he asks for the hand of the magic pee wielding woman so they can marry on the spot. All the while, her husband awkwardly watches the consequences of his wife not cheating on him unfold. Oh, and then Pharaoh's burned his old wife to death. Or at least that's how the legend goes. I highly doubt that it really did restore his eyesight and maybe he just ordered historians to write a good story to explain a weird habit. You know, <laughs> fetish. We got a <laughs> fetish here. Sammy <laughs> <Lacker -Kerr. laughs> Okay, so let's talk about horrible hygiene. Maybe an over exaggeration, but hygiene of any kind was better than whatever the hell they were trying to accomplish in Europe without showering. At least the people of ancient Egypt considered it an important enough cultural value that they'd wash once a day. Even if it meant they also shave their head, crunch down beetles for makeup, and rub dung on their ass. 2,000 years before Hesse Ray was credited for being the world's first dentist, the Egyptians were making their own toothbrush by fraying the ends of twigs. The toothpaste used was a powder like that vegan one at Lush that makes you feel like you're chewing on chalk. It was made of ox hooves, burnt eggshells, and pumice. Mmm, kiss me good morning after you rub that on your teeth with your dental twig, babe. Speaking of, for those whose breath smelled as bad as the armpits of the lower class Egyptians, also had numerous mouthwashes. Some had to be chewed up and spat out like bran or celery, honey was combined with boiled herbs and spices such as cinnamon and myrrh to form a dehydrated pellet which they also used as breath mints. And speaking of armpit, the Egyptians had a deodorant body rub made of ostrich egg, turtle shell, and roasted tamaris. Nothing like waking up bright and early for a day of building pyramids and the first thing you have to do is some casual Harry Potter potion making just to not smell like camel crap. Speaking of hygiene, your clothes were never clean. So even if your body was haha germaphobe, you still aren't safe. In the later periods of ancient Egyptian history, people began wearing clothes made of linen, not hides, cottons, furs, and rendered leathers like they used to. Linen was light and flexible, so it was good for the hot Egyptian climate. However, linen was white, meaning the clothes showed dirt very easily, an issue they hadn't really had to deal with before. But most materials they'd worn didn't hold up well underwater like linen did, so the ancient Egyptians started doing laundry more often to get rid of the dirt. But they washed their clothes in the Nile, where people also relieved themselves, and dumped garbage, and humidified
human bodies. So uh, this meant that the Egyptians washed their clothes in water filled with parasites and bacteria. Even if drying it in the sun baked most of that away, you then still had the world's chafiest linen. To learn who did the laundry, the labor, the provision, and the caretaking, let's discuss family values. You may as well pop a little white picket fence up around the pyramids, guys, because nobody idealized the nuclear family quite like the ancient Egyptians, who held it at the core of their society. There was a tremendous pride in one's family, and lineage was traced through both the mother's and the father's lines. Everyone, even the gods and goddesses, were married. While premarital relations or any romps between unmarried people were socially acceptable, an unmarried man was seen as incomplete, and schoolboys were advised to wed early and father as many children as possible. Once married, however, couples were expected to be sensually faithful to each other. Egyptians, with exception to the king, were in theory monogamous, and many records indicate the couples expressed true affection for each other. Although the institution of marriage was taken seriously, if you don't end up working out with the person you married at 15, shocker, divorce was not uncommon, let alone remarrying, so at least that was one little less impossible thing. Until marriage, following their parents' footsteps, boys were trained in the trades and professions by their fathers and uncles, while girls stayed at home to learn from their mothers. In their early adult years, girls would marry, move from home, and the cycle would start again. Would start again with the dreaded childbirth. Egypt had the highest birth rate in the ancient world, and yet things were far from perfect. Although the Egyptians understood the general functions of parts of the reproductive system, the relationship between said parts were sometimes unclear to them. Like the origin of a man's love potion, since it was white, is from his bones, because those are also white, and nothing else was. Logic, eh? Most married women spent most of their lives either pregnant or breastfeeding. With little medical advice available, amulets and charms bearing figures of the pregnant hippopotamus goddess Tarawet and the mini demigoddess Bess were often used to protect both the mother and her unborn child, as children of all sexes were valued and desired. The mother prepared for birth by removing her clothing, loosening her hair, or just snatching her wig off. They did wear wigs. The birth of the child was a great joy, as well as a serious concern given the high mortality rate and stress of childbirth on a mother. So a midwife was an important career in Egypt. The everyday mothers squatted on birthing bricks for delivery, wealthy households had specially constructed huts or pools, and the midwife used a sharp obsidian or flint knife to cut the umbilical cord. The midwife was also on standby to try and help in any troubling birth situations that may arise. After childbirth, you breastfed for how long? Next one is latch off already. One of the best ways to maintain a healthy infant under the less than sanitary conditions that prevailed in ancient times was by breastfeeding. In addition to transfer of antibodies through mother's milk, breastfeeding also offered protection from foodborne diseases. If your kid isn't exposed to potentially contaminated food at the time when their immune system is at its weakest, they're inherently going to survive longer. Way of the jungle, y'all. It's why we don't feed babies chicken. Indirect evidence for this occurring in ancient Egypt actually came to us from a number of cemeteries where young adults and unders death rates peaked at times that correlated with the introduction to solid foods in their body. Prolonged lactation also offered a number of health advantages to you as the mother. Primarily, it reduces the chances of conceiving another child too soon by hormonally suppressing ovulation, which allows the mother more enjoyable stress-free times with her husband between pregnancies. So, how long is prolonged? A minimum of a three-year period for suckling was recommended in the instructions of any from the new kingdom, and therefore struck an honestly unconscious but evolutionary important balance between the needs of procreation, the health of a mother, and the survival of a child. Number five, Xerxes the first. You've most likely heard of this guy. If not from his historically inaccurate portrayal in 300, then at least from one or two history classes. But Adam, wasn't he the emperor of Persia? Yeah, well guess what my little bees, Egypt was part of the Persian Empire, which makes him pharaoh as well. This guy gets a pretty bad rap in history, but who wrote that history? The Greeks who despised him for his attempted invasion of Greece. Oh, I'm not saying he was great or anything. In fact, he had a bit of a disregard for the traditions of the Egyptians and their way of life. But you cannot tell me that he was not significant in history. Xerxes the Great makes this list for his infamy more than anything else. Number four, Akhenaten. So this is gonna be the second not so beloved pharaoh on this list. But disdain for Akhenaten didn't come from war or the fact that his massive army was defeated by a group of a couple hundred Greeks. No. Akhenaten here was infamous for his devout following of a singular god, Aten, the god of the sun. He actually moved the capital of Egypt to a new location that he titled Akhetaten, or Horizon of Aten. And he kind of made everyone else worship the single god Aten as well. 
He was famous for a different reason though. Akhenaten was married to Nefertiti. She played a huge part in his religious plans and she is well known in history for the limestone bust that was made of her and has been copied so many freaking times. Number 3. Khufu When you think of Egypt, there is likely one thing that pops straight into your mind. If you say anything other than the Great Pyramids of Giza, you do not pass go, you do not collect $200, and you lose. Khufu is the pharaoh you have to thank for this wonder of the ancient world. We still sort of don't know exactly how it was constructed, but this goliath limestone and mud brick structure was the tallest building in the world for like 4,000 years. It was built as the housing for his tomb and as his stairway to heaven. No, not the Led Zeppelin song. It has three chambers inside of it plus a gallery that we've discovered so far. As for what else Khufu contributed to ancient Egyptian life, we don't have much in the way of texts about that yet. But if this is the main thing, then I mean, I'd take it. Number 2. Cleopatra. How could she not be on this list? She was the very last pharaoh Egypt ever had, and she was arguably one of the most famous ones. Not only becoming a figure in history, but a character in literature, theater, and media. Cleopatra VII was pharaoh in Egypt from 51 to 30 BC, and it was one hell of a reign. She introduced tons of reforms to improve the Egyptian economy. She was an awesome diplomat and a scholar. She didn't have things too easy though. Having to fight her own brother for the throne and having to do some diplomacy with various famous Romans. Things kind of fizzled out near the end, but she certainly ended the line of Egyptian pharaohs with a beloved bang, as was her style. Number 1. Ramses II Alright, this one was definitely the one I thought of first. Ramses II is arguably the most famous of all the pharaohs. He reigned for 67 years. He had 96 children. He had a crazy successful military campaign conquering the Hittites, Syrians, and Nubians. No other pharaoh that we know of has been able to build like he has. He lived to the age of 90, which is insane for back then. And he professed himself a god, which I'm sure some people actually believed. Even today, when we moved his remains to France for restoration, he had to be given a passport that literally said, King, deceased, under the occupation. Truly an incredibly influential pharaoh. Kicking off our list at number 10, Ancient Egyptian Eyeliner. Whenever you see hieroglyphics or any art depicting the great pharaohs, they're usually rocking some impressive eyeliner. They look great, right? Like a 90s pop star, they look awesome. Ancient Egyptians were the OG eyeliner users. They made their own eyeliner from lead salts. And no, before you think about getting creative, do not try this at home. This wasn't an ideal process. See, for starters, these salts were quite high in lead concentration. So in order to avoid that mess, ancient Egyptians first First had to process and then filter that lead salt for up to 30 days in order to get the lead levels low enough to even be applied. So you had to plan accordingly. You're like, oh, I have a pharaoh date in 30 days? Perfect. We'll start now. It was a hazard if done incorrectly. Not only was this ancient beauty practice, well, beautiful to look at, but Egyptians also needed eyeliner to protect against sun damage as well as fight off any infections. Yeah, we don't encourage rubbing lead on your eyes today. We have a few different methods on, you know, how to look good. I think. None of them include lead, hopefully, ideally. Number nine, hair gel. Back in my day, in high school, I had to use Dippity Do Extra Hold Hair Gel. Yeah, I showed a scale on the side, I always got the five out of six hold, that was good. Six was too much, nobody ever did the full six, that's crazy talk. But in ancient Egypt, we didn't have styling spiking glue and blasting free spray by DJ Polly D. No, we have that today, unfortunately, but back then, a little different. Back then, ancient Egyptians loved styling their hair, but again, before DJ Polly D was born, what is a pharaoh to do? If the Great Pyramids are any indication, they knew something that we didn't. Ancient Egyptians knew how to keep their hair in one place all day long. And that heat too? How do you do it? My curls? I'm jealous. Their hair styling gel was made with shea butter and coconut oil. But more often than not, they would replace coconut oil with almond oil. So this was a completely natural and strengthening styling gel. Cut to today, we have whatever that is. Psst, ice spray. That's awesome. DJ Polly. Psst. 
No. Number eight, coffee scrub. I love coffee. I don't think I love coffee enough to do a coffee face scrub, but hey, never say never. I'll try anything once. Ancient Egyptians would use coffee scrub to reduce inflammation, improve blood circulation, and since it's a ground up material, it's gonna remove those dead skin cells at the same time. Next holiday season, grab your aunt some coffee scrub. Just tell her how it reduces puffiness, improves the skin's texture, all that good stuff. It'll give you that youthful feral look that you've been going for, you know what I mean? Merry Christmas, here you go, coffee on your face. Using grounded coffee powder to exfoliate your skin sounds like a new idea. It's certainly a hot trend today. But before TikTok, ancient Egyptians already knew these benefits. Damn, I'm gonna get a coffee scrub. Maybe I'll do it, I don't know. After I'm done this cup, I'll just rub it on my face, on my desk, and see what uh, everyone says. Number seven, dead sea salt. You'll never feel more alive than when you use dead sea salt. Here we go. Ancient Egyptians were ahead of the exfoliation game. Dare I say, they invented it. Not only were coffee scrubs a necessity, but salt from the dead sea was one of the most popular popular ancient Egyptian skincare products ever. We traveled far and wide for this one. Salt collected from the Dead Sea was used to exfoliate dead skin cells, and it was so well known at this point that rumor has it, Cleopatra herself would travel all the way to the Dead Sea from Egypt just to take a bath. Yeah, let's be honest, after this point, we'd all love a rejuvenating Dead Sea float. That sounds way better than what I've got at home. Well, bathtub, I can't even fit in this thing. Dead Sea sounds way better. I once left a house party early to go have a bath. Sort of God, York University. Dipped at like 10 o'clock. I was like, I'm cold, I'm not doing this. 40 minute walk, worth it. Leave your friends for a bath, do it. Number six, wax cones. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. You've probably seen them in a thumbnail here at some point. The art depicting head cones is quite unique looking. It's like a pharaoh with a triangle on their head. You're like, what's happening there? What is this? Was this like Illuminati? What is this? Long before Pantene Pro-V, when it came to head cleanliness, these triangular wax cones were here to save the day. And they looked pretty fun to use. I don't know, they would just sit on top of your head. You didn't need to mix anything with lead for 30 days or burn or anything like that. You don't need to put any organs in jars, just a wax cone atop of your head, easy. Back in 2019, experts found archeological evidence that they were in fact used. So yeah, not just a glyph real life history. So I have to bring this up. Men and women alike would wear this cone and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone down and through your hair. The cone itself was made of oils, fat, resin. It would be placed on their wig or directly onto your head and it would keep melting and refreshing all day long. It's like a little candle almost. A nice little human candle. Nice little Egyptian man candle. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. It's a little easier nowadays. I'm too tall too. I can't have a wax cone. Are you kidding me? It would hit this mic. No way. Number five. Can't take it with you. In life, you live and then you pass on. If you believe in the home send signs your mom hangs up in her kitchen, then there's gonna be a lot of living, laughing, and loving with that. Ancient Egyptians believed in taking things with them to the afterlife. Yeah, pretty much everything was coming with them. Gold, treasure, organs, except the brain, and pretty much just anything you would need for that kind of adventure. Well, animals were no different. Oftentimes when discovering tombs of kings in the main chamber, or sometimes in their own, were statues of cats and dogs, and naturally, mummified kitties and doggies. Now, I love my pets just as much as the next guy, but uh, a discovery in 2019 revealed a tomb with statues, mummies, and even some preserved crocodiles. Ooh, weird, that's a weird pet. Number four, Tomb KV5. Sometimes you pass things off without giving them the proper time and attention. Like the fact that your middle toe on one of your feet is a little longer than the same one on the other side, and you're like, ah, Ah, it's probably fine, but it's actually a mutation that all of your ancestors had and it's the reason you can walk faster than everyone else. Not that that's happened to me or anything, but the archaeologists of tomb KV-5 know what I'm talking about, sort of. Basically, KV-5 was not studied very well, and in 1995, it turns out that it was actually one of the largest tombs ever created in the Valley of the Kings. So far, we have found around 121 chambers and corridors, and we think there will be 150 total. The tomb was used for the sons of Ramses II, who, as we know, had over 100 kids. So, the size of the tomb kind of checks out. So far, we've only confirmed six, but there are likely to be around 20 of his sons down there. Number three, the Pyramids of Giza. A lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries. But like, how, how, could, how could you miss them? Okay, obviously people can see these bad boys from miles away. It would be kind of hard to lose something like that. 
as Adam said. But then again, as a man, I take pride in losing my car keys every time I need to use them. But more specifically, it was the discovery of the inner chambers of the pyramids that really kicked off archaeology. The verdict? Well, these pyramids not only hold riches and riches of historical knowledge, but the engineering involved is out of this world, which, you know, is kind of how some people think they were constructed today. The complexity and craftsmanship. The complexity and craftsmanship still has people scratching their heads. As for me, I believe that with enough careful planning and engineering, mixed in with a whole heap of uh, forced labor, you can just get about anything done. There's still much to be learned about these giants in the desert. Ooh. Number two, Aten. Even today, we are still making huge discoveries in Egypt. I mean, maybe not specifically today, April 27th, or whenever you watch this, but in this day and age. In 2020, we discovered a 3,000 year old city buried in the sand, and it's probably the biggest discovery since our number one spot. The city named Aten, or the Rise of Aten, is the largest city of its kind that we have found and gives us a really good look at life during Egypt's most profitable era. That would be the rule of Amon. That would be the rule of Amenhotep III. Amenhotep IV is his son, who would drastically change the country's direction. Following his father's death, the fourth changed his name to Akhenaten, abandoned the old Egyptian gods besides the sun god Aten, and moved the royal seat from Thebes to the new city of Akhetaten, which is known as Amarna. He was a weird one, but this city wasn't weird. It was impressive, with an administration area as well as residential districts, production area where mud bricks, amulets, and other goods for buildings and temples were made, along with a bakery. Yeah, I love my croissants covered in sand too. Number one, King Tut, the man, the myth, the legend. Besides the pyramids, the sand, and the hot sun, nothing is more famous out of Egypt than King Tut. Well, why is this? Is he not just another royal bro who's just big chilling in his tomb? Eh, yeah, sort of, but his tomb is very unique actually. Unfortunately for Egyptians and archaeologists alike, a lot of the tombs have been cleaned out by grave robbers and crooks, some of which are just long gone. The stuff could have been heisted at any point really, we're just not sure. King Tut's tomb, however, was pretty well untouched, and because of this, we got the chance to learn about a king who really didn't do too much. I think the sarcophagus stands out the most, the, the gold and the blue, it's beautiful. I love it. It's good aesthetic. We're gonna start with peace treaties. Egyptologists know Ramses II as the pharaoh who restored Egypt's relations with Syria and built a lot of neat temples in the desert back in the 1200s BC. And he's the one in that Disney movie whose first son gets smoked by the plague. Kind of a wild guy, so we'll talk about him quite a bit in this vid. Anyways, for over two centuries, the Egyptians fought against the Hittite Empire for control of lands in modern-day Syria. The conflict gave rise to a bloody boot down, such as the 1247 BC Battle of Kadesh, but by the time of the pharaoh Ramesses II, neither side had emerged as a clear victor, and this was just becoming all drawn out and bloody and just plain stupid, especially with both empires facing threats from people outside each other. But who's ever going to be the first to wave the white flag, let's be real, when it comes to two dudes, y'all are notoriously known for just beating each other up, shaking hands, and best friends again. So in 1259 BC, the two said ah to hell with it, let's do lunch, and Ramesses II and the Hittite king Hatsu Sili III negotiated a famous peace treaty, one that was either the first known in creation, or one of the earliest ever. This agreement ended the conflict and decreed the two kingdoms would aid each other in the event of an invasion by a third party. This treaty is now recognized as one of the earliest surviving peace accords, and a copy can be seen above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council. How about some ancient Egyptian body dysmorphia, because bodies are supposed to look like this, right? That's what Akhenaten was probably wondering, and it must have been awkward as hell for fine as cell queen Nefertiti and normal looking son King Tut to try and lie their way through any reply to that because this whack job was known for two things. Firstly, as who forced monotheism on Egypt so brutally that when he died, his son had to awkwardly erase his legacy. And secondly, he was one funny looking dude. He had an hourglass figure like a BBL baddie, an elongated head with a square jaw jutting out, big curved almond eyes, and let's say he could have filled out a bra better than me. So, Egyptians like to play Photoshop with their selfies the way we do now, and the first depictions of Ak, his body and head are normal. But after he forced monotheism, that literally destroyed the economy and empire, his gender in sculptures and carvings became more 
ambiguous. Three explanations. First, he's the most hated pharaoh in history. So I mean, come on, artistic license, get some anger out. Second, perhaps his changing appearance was metaphorical, meant to portray Ak as the father and mother of all humankind. Third, is that it was a genetic disorder, such as amitrace excess syndrome, where the body released equal levels of both hormones. But we all know what the likely one was, seeing as these guys could quite literally not keep their hands or really any appendage out of their family members. I'm not gonna lie, I can't handle having eyeliner on for three hours that me and my roommate go out. Meanwhile, the pharaohs had obligatory face beat, like they were working at ancient Sephora every day. Early Greek traders who visited Egypt were astonished by the sophistication and precision with which Egyptians took care of their skin and hair and decorated their bodies. Europeans remarked that almost everyone was wearing makeup, even in public places, and that'd be accurate as both men and women were known to wear copious amounts of the stuff, believing it gave them the protection of the gods Horus and Ra, who were always fighting or banging each other and doing so in a full face of makeup like some spectacular fursuit wearing drag queens. The only distinguishing factor between men and women's makeup was that men's makeup was simple while women's was often heavier and more complex. The distinguishing factor of all makeup, however, was wealth. Nobles could afford the fresher or less diluted products, while lower status had to use makeup from poorer quality materials, which sucks since they worked in the sun all day, and higher quality coal you lined your eyes with, the better it reduced sun reflection. This act will also protect them from evil spirits and eye diseases, as they believe their makeup had magical hearing powers, and they weren't entirely wrong. Research has shown that lead-based cosmetics worn along the Nile actually staved off eye infections. Alright, you annoying ancient astronaut people, this is for you, Tut Space Knife. I am not sitting here doing the work for y'all, pretending we all don't know who King Tut is. He was the child pharaoh, smoked by a hippo bite, cursed tomb, blah 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 blah. So we're just going to get right to it and say he had a knife literally from space. Specifically, a small dagger, but whatever effing y'all, this thing is so sharp. To this day, the TSA would tackle you sooner than let you board anything with it. They found it in Tut's tomb in 1920s with all that other magical treasury hunky-dory that they stole out of there, and it was originally believed to be forged from the iron heart of a meteorite. Originally, ah, keyword, see, Egyptians didn't have the ability to smell. They weren't actually suitably advanced in that realm. So they especially wouldn't be able to forge a weapon from space metal, let alone crack open a meteorite to get to it, or know that was even an option. This has led historians to presume that the dagger was a gift from a foreign nation that did possess smelty technology. While historians are pretty confident the foreign nation wasn't the Martians, they haven't explicitly ruled that out either, so I guess those ancient alien guys might have a point. If you like stuff like this, check out our top 10 alien hieroglyphs found in ancient history video. The story of how two pharaohs throw down over pet hippos. So, Pharaoh Sekinenri Teo, I'm gonna call him Sek, the second, kept a pool full of pet hippopotamuses, letting his massive pets splash and play all day. Obviously, you don't get close because these are blind rage death animal machines, but this guy loved his hippos so much he could kill for them. He was willing to die for them. In fact, he literally did just that. This is back when Egypt was divided and the most powerful Egyptian kingdom was called Haikos, which was ruled by Pharaoh Apopi. Being a lesser king, Sek was required to pay tributes to Apopi out of respect. He could handle the humiliation of living under the tyranny of another man, RIP fragile male ego, but as long as Apopi didn't rub it in or act like an ass about it. So that's exactly what Apopi did. He went right for the sore spot by telling Sek to get rid of his hippos. Apparently they were too loud and Apopi couldn't sleep at night in his own house that was 750 kilometers away. Yeah, no. Sek says, hey, I can handle you bullying me constantly, but leave the hippos out of this. And he would not tolerate any further insults to his hippos. This, he declared, was grounds for war. That's what they did. Sek even died in combat, fighting for his right to a hippo pool. The war didn't end when he died, however. His son kept it going. Two generations of kings fought for a hippo pool. And in time, they won. By the end of the war, Egypt had unified once more. All because of one man's love for his hippos. Sorostis, the genital king, is number five. Why genital king? Well, aside from being one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, he commemorated his success in a unique way, by setting up a big pillar with a picture of someone's genitals on it. Male or female, he wasn't picky. He sent warships and troops to every corner of the known world and stretched his kingdom further than anyone else ever had, leaving these pillars on sites of every battleground. Aside from genital the pillars were of course ingrained with how he had subdued his enemies and how certain he was that the gods were in favor of his invade everyone policy. Quite cocky of him. The genitals depicted were based off of how valiantly their opponents had fought their invasion. Male depiction indicated that they were strong and brave soldiers. But the female depiction, well, it meant the word that we are all thinking. These pillars lore left all across the continent and they stood the test of time. 1500 years later, after being erected, they still stand in sea 
Syria, engraved with the genitals of failure. Look up the word spoil and you'll see number four is Pepe II. He was the longest ruling Egyptian monarch, surviving 94 years on the throne. The first half of this rule, he brought prosperity and grandeur to Egypt. Second half, nowhere close. In fact, it's the mark of the sharp decline of the old kingdom of Egypt, as economic disarray was due to him virtually having no oversight. Pepe was made pharaoh in his early teen years, so naturally he got the spoiled brat treatment from mommy. A great example is shortly after being crowned, an explorer sent to trade and collect ivory, ebony, and other precious items had written him a letter reporting that he had met a dancing pygmy. Why? This is the greatest thing Pepe had ever heard! He had to see it for himself. So he demanded its transport back immediately and to abandon all precious materials they'd gathered in return for a high reward. Well, he got his dancing pygmy and he got pretty much everything he's ever asked for. He learned to accept that he was more important than other people. By the time he'd grown up, he was so corrupt that he made his serfs strip naked, cover themselves in honey, and follow him around just to keep the flies away. Number three is the klepto gaslighting Amasis. He's remembered as a total prick. Amasis actually made his way onto the throne after the current pharaoh had sent him to calm down a rebellion, but when he got there he realized the rebels had a pretty good chance of winning, so he decided to lead them instead. Amasis decided the best way to tell the king about his change of sides and a declaration of war was by lifting his leg, farting, and telling the messenger to take that back to the king. He was a rampant alcoholic as well as a kleptomaniac. Apparently he would steal his friends' stuff put it in his own temples and then try to convince them that they had never owned it in the first place. However, amongst all his bratty behavior, Amasis brought some major reform to oracles. One example actually comes from when he was a poor thief on the street. When he had been caught stealing, he had been sent to stand in front of oracles who were supposedly be able to divine tell whether he was innocent or guilty. Well, once he was king, he remembered which oracles had pronounced him innocent of the crimes he had committed and had them punished for fraud. Because if they'd actually been able to speak to the gods, they would have known he was always guilty. Number two is Cutting down on crime, Actus Sains. Amasis wasn't tolerated for long and he was overthrown the way he'd done to his predecessor. This time the rebellion was led by the Ethiopian Actus Sains, who believed in a gentler approach to kinghood. Actus Sains fought for the crown literally because of a magic spell he'd heard about and also to deal with Egypt's criminals in a flashy new way, controlled exile. Every person who committed a crime he ruled would have their nose cut off and then they'd be sent off to the town he called Rhinoclora, literally the town of cut off noses. It was exclusively populated by these now noseless criminals struggling to survive in the harsh landscape, drinking dirty water and eating trash or the odd stray quail that came through. Something like this may have seemed harsh, but it was actually considered benevolence at the time. Roman chronologers of Rinacola, or Rincolora, whichever it's pronounced, wrote an example of how Actus Sains was actually considering a kindly manner towards his subjects. So keep that in mind when you're doing a comparison of now versus then. And in at number one is Akhenaten. This pharaoh was so hated that the Egyptians themselves wiped his name out of history. Born Amenhotep, he changed his name to Ahak, I'm gonna call him Ak, in accordance with this radical monotheistic drive. His new name meant that he is of service to the Aten, in honor of what he believed to be the one true god, Aten, the sun god. Acted everything in the name of the sun god. He moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Amarnia, and then renamed it in Egyptian to mean Horizon of Aten, and then he ordered a new capital city be built there. He chose the site because it was uninhabited. It was not the property of anyone else except Aten. He moved an estimated 20,000 people into this developing city and forced them to build it. These people had to push through everything. Based on the bones found in the town cemetery, more than two thirds of his workers broke a bone while they are working and a good one third of them broke their spines. Almost everyone was malnourished. When he enforced monotheism, Ak failed to realize that the temples of Egypt were the national, socionomic, and cultural hubs. It was the gods' priests that oversaw the industries of agriculture and craftsmanship through their patronage and they who served as pillars of their communities. So by stripping these temples of authority, he caused Egypt's biggest recession and an entire empire nearly collapsed because of him. So it's no wonder after his death, Egypt immediately went back to polytheism and they also abandoned the new city he'd made them build. They destroyed his statues, his effigies, his monuments, and they removed him from their list of kings and history books. In fact, they did this so efficiently that we didn't really even know about him until his remains were found all alone in the city he had forced his subjects to create. Number 10, Tutankhamun. This guy is arguably the most famous Egyptian pharaoh. So what is he doing at the top of the list? Well, King Tut wasn't famous for anything he really did in his lifetime. 
I mean, he was a young pharaoh, but someone on this list was technically pharaoh since he was two. No, he wasn't famous for anything he really did. Instead, Tutankhamun's tomb, discovered in 1922, was one of the greatest archaeological discoveries ever. It was almost entirely intact, and his sarcophagus was incredible. Tutankhamun only lived to the age of 20, and how he lost the spark of life is actually still a mystery. He may not have done much other than a lot of religious reforms, but he managed to find another way of living forever. Number 9. Djoser So, with King Tut, he didn't really do much in his short lifetime. With Djoser, we actually don't really know a lot of what he did. Also like Tutankhamun, it was what he did for and after his departure from life that made him famous. Djoser was responsible for the construction of the limestone step pyramid at Saqqara, the first of its kind. It was a huge architectural achievement. A building that stays structurally sound no matter how big it gets? Well, knock me down and call me Susan. The pyramid was actually completed after he lost the will to live by his official Imhotep. Number 8. Amenhotep III Okay, on to the members of the list who we know did something significant for Egypt during their time on the earth. Amenhotep III ruled an artistically and financially successful Egypt. He had pretty stellar reviews on Google for his trade relations which boosted up the economy of Egypt, but it was his artistic side that got him a bit more of a lasting recognition. He is the pharaoh with the most statues of himself. He created tons of monuments and a lot of stone scarabs that still hold up with tons of stories of historical events. I want some statues myself. Is, is that weird? Probably. Number 7. Hatshepsut Now look, women in Egypt had high status and were respected more than in other parts of the world at the time. But a female pharaoh, while not unheard of, was unfortunately still pretty rare. Hatshepsut here was known as the most successful of those female pharaohs. Her father, King Thutmose I, wanted her to inherit the throne, and to that end, she was brought up learning how to lead. She reigned for 21 years after the death of her husband, and everything she did, from tons of construction projects to creating trade routes, went off without a single hitch. The people of Egypt lived in peace for her entire rule. Number 6. Thutmose III Thutmose III was, surprisingly, the son of Thutmose II, who was the husband of Hatshepsut. You know, number seven, the most successful female pharaoh. So that's the kind of cloth we're working with here. Thutmose was only two when his father bit the dust. So while he was technically the next pharaoh, his stepmother took over with him as co-ruler. This guy's contributions to the Egyptians were tremendous though. He was literally called the Napoleon of Egypt, which, Shouldn't Napoleon be the Thutmose III of France? Either way, Thutmose III. He helped expand Egypt like none before. He was a dope warrior and he helped in the construction of a lot of stuff. Most importantly, the Temple of Karnak. That's how you make Mama proud. Despite not knowing how he died, we know after he did, there was a big ol' succession mess. Post-Tut, the pharaoh get plot gets all dicey. Horma was the chosen heir for the throne, and was off waging war against the Hittites. The coup theory for Tut's death revolved around his elderly chief advisor, I, because we do not know how or why a high official like him came to be king of Egypt otherwise. He definitively stole the crown and throne from Horma in his absence, though. Ancient letters suggest that either Nefertiti or, more likely, Tut's widow, and Senamun was desperate to prevent Ai from becoming pharaoh and asked the king of the Hittites, who they are at literal war with, to send a prince who could marry her and rule Egypt. An and Nefertiti are erased from history around that time. During his short reign, King Ai tried in vain to achieve peace with said Hittites, while also simultaneously trying to prevent Horame, the true regent of Tut, from seizing the throne while he's alive and after he died. To do so, he named an heir, an army commander named Nakahimti, who we know as perhaps to be Ai's own grandson. As as you can imagine, Nakahimti became Horambe's great rival, but Ai's successor would finally be Horam when his three year reign ends. Horam would then rule for nearly 30 years and then remove all known history of Tut 
and TAA Nefertiti and Tut's father Ah. Now that's a mystery as to why. And while we're on the topic, where is On? For over 3,000 years, her life has been a mystery to us and mostly made up of bizarre facts and strange omissions. Like that despite being the third daughter of the pharaoh, she was once his wife too before marrying her half brother Tut. <laughs> when Tut died, the corrupt priests chose an heir, General Harambe, known lunatic. Anne was terrified and realized the kingdom was being lost to corruption in secret societies. She potentially writes to the King Hittites during their time of war, as mentioned, offering herself and the throne of Egypt to one of his sons. The prince in specific was Zanzania, and he set out for Egypt and is killed before he arrives. Historians believe this was Horemheb's doing. Anne is forced to marry Ai so he can steadfastly secure his place on the throne, and then, like that, she vanishes from history, an absence that some historians say signal her death. But it isn't the only time that has fragmented her story. An's role of ancient Egypt's most contentious period was lost deliberately, excised from the annals of history by the new dynasty that rose to power just decades later. DNA testing she may have been one of the female mummies found in Key V21, but for now she remains shrouded in mystery. The story of the Cobra and Canary is next. Howard Carter, self-taught archaeologist, plunderer, thief, and is responsible for the discovery and opening of King Tut's tomb. Prior to said opening, he had bought a golden canary, hoping its chatter and song would cheer up his empty house. When he first brought it home, one of his housemates tells Carter, It's a bird of gold that will bring luck. This year we will find a tomb full of gold. Well, howdy doody, either that bird summoned gold or the maid is a fortune teller. Within a week of purchasing the canary, Carter discovers Tut's tomb. And before knowing whose tomb they had found, the workers nicknamed it the Tomb of the Golden Bird, a bird that becomes an omen of what's to come. During the recent excavations which led to the discovery of the tomb of Tuck Muhammad, Mr. Howard Carter had in his house a canary which daily regaled him with its happy song. On the day, however, on which the entrance to the tomb was laid bare, a cobra entered the house, pounced on the bird, and swallowed it. Now cobras are rare in Egypt and seldom seen in winter, but in ancient times they were regarded as symbol of royalty, and each pharaoh wore the symbol upon his forehead as though to signify his power to strike and sting his enemies. And obviously this segue is us to the classic mystery of the mummy's curse. I'm of the opinion anyone who pillages or destroys history deserves to have a curse, so Howard Carter and company, please continue rolling in your graves, bud, you earned this. So George Herbert funded the excavation and died from blood poisoning days later. Legend has it when the Lord Carnivon died, all the lights in his house and in Cairo, Egypt mysteriously went out. Howard Carter gave a mummified hand wearing a bracelet inscribed saying, cursed he be who moves my body, to his friend Bruce ink him as a gift, ink him that man did not like you. His house burned to the ground not long after and when he tried to rebuild it was hit by a flood. George J. Gould dies after one visit. Aubrey Herbert dies of gum rot. Hugh Evelyn White takes his own life but not before writing in blood I have succumbed to the curse which forces me to disappear. Aaron Ember and his whole family dies and Richard Bethel is suffocated by apparently the Satanist Aleister Crowley of all people. Archibald Douglas Richard died three days after x-raying Tut and then James Henry Breasted dies on his next Egypt trip. Mystery or what do you think? And last on our list is the alien jewel. The amazing story began 77 years after Carter's discovery when an Italian geologist noticed something odd about the yellow green scar up in the pectoral center. The subsequent tests proved that the lump of glass was older than any Egyptian society, a lot older in fact. Experts trace this scar up back to the Great Sand Sea, 500 miles Miles southwest of Cairo, in which there are known to be huge lumps of glass poking out of the dunes. The general opinion is that a meteor hit the desert hundreds of thousands of years ago, heating the sand enough to create glass. To give you the idea of the magnitude that this supposed impact, the first AB testing done created a thin frost-like layer of glass in the New Mexico desert. Meanwhile, chunks of glass the size of literal human heads can be picked up from the Great Sand Sea to this day. That means this meteor hit with an impact that we humans can't recreate on a different type of scale. But there's no evidence of a meteor that has ever struck the desert. If this glass is of meteoric origin, then there should be a crater of that age, says Boston University Farouk Al-Baz. But no crater, let alone partially fused or a serial piece, has ever been found. This suggests the less exciting origin, a super saturated lake of silica that slowly dried into a natural glass hard enough to resist a scalpel mark. What do you think? Mystery glass from aliens or no? Number two, Ramses II with a vengeance. As some of you may know, Ramses II was the greatest of the rulers of the 19th dynasty and second longest reigning pharaoh ever. 
He lived to the age of 90, was an amazing warrior, leading the armies of Egypt by the age of 22, and has literal tons of statues of himself all over Egypt. He is also probably a lot of people's ancestors since he had 96 sons and 60 daughters, approximately. So yeah. It was kind of a big deal in 1881 when archaeologists discovered his mummy with a whole bunch of other ones in a secret chamber at Deir al Bari. Originally, Ramses was buried in the Valley of the Kings, as he should have been. But because of the risk of grave robbings, he was moved to a secret chamber. And then, after his discovery and stay at the museum in Cairo, he was moved again in the 70s when he got a passport to travel to Paris. This guy gets around. Number 9, Rosetta Stone. You are too fine to be laying down in bed alone. I can teach you my language, Rosetta Stone. Man, we all miss the old Drake. Girl, don't tempt me. Anyway, speaking of diamonds in the rough, the Rosetta Stone. Pretty pretty shocking and important find. What is it? Well, basically it's a large stone tablet that has the same paragraph written on it in three separate languages. Why is this so important, you may ask? Well, it's basically helped us learn everything we know about ancient Egypt. More specifically, translating Egyptian to Greek and then to English. Or, since it was discovered by some of Napoleon's people and forces, uh, it would have been in French. To put it in modern terms, it's as if you were back in grade 11 reading Shakespeare and not understanding a single word, but then the bully in school finds the cliff notes for Romeo and Juliet and decides to do a nice thing and share them with everybody. Yep, that makes sense. Good euphemism. That's a good one. Number 8. Khufu's Ship when pharaohs passed on into the afterlife, they put a whole whack of stuff inside their tombs that were meant to come with them into the next plane of existence. It's why we see the mummified versions of their favorite cats and dogs, favorite foods, and tons of treasure. Unfortunately, after you're gone and buried, some opportunistic people are gonna bust down your tomb doors and steal all your stuff. I'd like to see those grave robbers steal what Khufu brought with him. In 1954, archaeologists found out that, among other things, Khufu had a 140 foot boat with his name on it, buried in pieces at the base of the Great Pyramid where he was entombed. It was almost perfectly intact, and after digging it out of the ground, they put it on display at the Solar Boat Museum, right next to where it was buried. Hopefully, that's close enough for Khufu to still use it in the afterlife. Number 7 Mummy Workshop. Here's a recent discovery for you. Archaeologists in 2018 discovered a well preserved embalming workshop complete with labeled oils. Ooh. What's an embalming workshop, you ask? Well, it's the place where kings go to shed a few pounds. Ooh. By that, I mean have their organs removed to be pickled in jars for the afterlife. My favorite part of this process is removing the brain. Because, you know, you don't need that. Lots of folks walk around without those all the time. Basically, you get a long hook surgical tool and you find the good pink stuff up here through the nose. After stirring the pharaoh's memories like an Italian baker mixing bread dough, you flip the royal over and just let that all drain out until she's empty. I legitimately get queasy when talking about the stuff, that's not a joke, I, I seriously do. But you know what, I'm glad we found the place and smarter people than I understand it. All I know is that if an Egyptian embalmer asks you to lick the spoon, you say no. Don't do it. Number 6. Construction Manifest You know, a lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries. But like, how, how, could, how could you miss them? You know? What stumped people about the pyramids is how they were built. So for our next discovery, how about the discovery of a port in 2013 that had a piece of papyri? Isn't that so much more exciting than a massive 138 meter tall building? Mm -hmm. The piece of papyri actually was a sort of manifesto for those massive buildings. It basically said, the limestone used in the Great Pyramid was shipped from a quarry at Tura to Giza along the Nile River. It also said that it took four days, and it talked a little bit about how long Khufu was in charge of Egypt and the guy who was in charge of building the pyramids. See, it's, it's very exciting. Number 5. Honey Coated Who here hates bugs bothering them in the summer? Unless they're a bumblebee, because we love bumblebees here, right guys? But me too. No one likes the buzzing of blood suckers nipping at your skin while you're chilling out on the beach or barbecue. Well, guess what? Egyptian pharaohs hated it too, except they didn't have bug spray. So what did they do? Well, you know the phrase, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar? Well, they took that literally. Conveniently, they had servants around them at all times, so to help with the bug problem, they covered them with honey so as to distract the bees and the bugs. So as the pharaohs lounged on the sand, 
man or wherever they were, their dutiful servants took on the job of taking on the bug bites. King Pepe, for instance, had a dedicated slave in his entourage who endured it every day. Poor guy. It was so effective that he had one designated in each room. Poor guys. Number four, assassins. This wasn't necessarily something that he did, but something that happened to him that was pretty messed up. As you can guess from the title, it involved assassins. Ramses III had a lot on his plate during his reign. There were this group of seafarers trying to destroy everyone, the tomb builders did their first labor strike over wage delays, I get you, the economy was deteriorating, weather was devastating, food production, things were corrupt as hell. And on top of all this, his secondary wife T.A. hated his guts. She along with a dozen members of his harem, the head of the treasury, a military captain, a butler, the butler did it, and the chief royal chief. Chamberlain hatched an assassination plot. In 2012, researchers used a high powered CT scanner on Ramsey's mummy and saw a massive throat gash covered by an amulet said to have healing powers. The researchers summarized that an assassin cut through Ramsey's esophagus and trachea, killing him practically instantly because he probably would have just let out that fast. Some other research suggests that this happened before the other assassination plot unraveled, but either way, not a good way to go. Number three, till death do us part. Remember that thing I mentioned at the beginning? Well, if you were servant to a pharaoh in ancient Egypt, you were hoping that your dude lived a long time because once they bite the dust, so did you. Now keep in mind, ancient Egyptians believed strongly in the afterlife. So when you died, you didn't just disappear, you literally just traveled to another world. That's the whole idea behind religion anyway. The discovery team organized by NYU, Yale, and the University of Pennsylvania discovered macabre evidence of this tradition. While excavating the mortuary ritual site of Pharaoh Aha, they found six graves not far from his tomb. They were skeletons of court officials, servants, artisans who appear to have been sacrificed to serve the Pharaoh in the afterlife. Aha's successor, Dajir, had more than 200, which are also presumed to be sacrificial burials as well. Number two, Marrying your siblings. Again, remember the thing I mentioned before and now I'm actually getting to it? Promised, I promised, and here we are. Not so long ago, it was normal to court your very own cousin, but today that would be considered very large taboo. I'm not gonna lie, it gives me the skippies, okay? I don't like imagining ma even marrying any of my cousins. That's weird to me. But the ancient Egyptians took things even farther, or should I say brought it closer, by marrying their very own siblings. Hey. That's one way to guarantee that the line will stay in the family. But knowing what we know about the genetic pool being too close and the complications that can arise, there's things that can go wrong. But nevertheless, it happened. DNA testing from King Tut's corpse revealed that he was a product of a union between two siblings. Pharaohs believed that they were descended from the gods. Therefore, keeping it in the family was crucial in maintaining that bloodline. King Tut even married his own half-sister, same dad, when he was just 10 years old. However, generations of inbreeding resulted in a bone disease that got more severe each time. Cleopatra also married her own brother as well. That was a that was a whole thing, and then she met Caesar and that whole thing we talked about, yeah, that thing. Let's move on. Number one, Akhenaten. One of the most polarizing figures in Egyptian history, Akhenaten tried to get rid of religion and as a result, they got rid of him. Akhenaten earned the title Heretic King and a recent discovery has revealed that his deeds might have been a lot darker. Akhenaten came to power in the 1350s and reigned for around 17 years. He is known for creating a new religion surrounding Aten, who was generally represented as a sun disk. Sometime around his fourth year, he started sending out agents to erase names and images of certain gods from existing texts and monuments. Around the fifth year, he claimed to discover the location of the new royal city and moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Akhetaten, today known as Tel El Amarna. There, his people suffered greatly under slave labor, with bodies being uncovered younger than 20, many with bones broken, spines broken, along with evidence of severe malnutrition. When the pharaoh finally passed, his tomb remained unfinished and his name was stricken from the history books. At least now, we can see why. Starting off our list at number 10, the first peace treaty. Unusual at the time, absolutely. The first peace treaty in history was back in 1271 BC. At this point in history, Egyptians and the Hittite Empire were fighting over modern day Syria. This conflict had been lasting centuries and come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was finally underway. Tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. What's left to do now at this point? 
Ramses II and King Hattusili III both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if a third party decided to get involved. A copy of the treaty can be found right now in New York above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty ever. That's how you know it's official. Our man Guinness confirms it. Boom, that's how you know. Moving on. Number nine, game night. I love board games, and honestly, that includes Monopoly. I have the patience for it every now and then, you know? Pass and go, I'm like, okay, I'll pay the tax. I'm respecting this game so far. But ancient Egyptians, turns out they also loved board games. Dogs and Jackals, Mehen, Senate, and 20 Squares, those are some popular games. Mehen was played during the pre-dynastic period, around 2500 BC, and the goal here was to reach the center of the spiral. The board was a coiled snake almost. Senate was the most popular game. Kings and queens alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Of course, the rules are still unknown, heavily debated, just like Monopoly today. I'm like, is it 200 or 100, are we sure? But now we have some ideas how Egyptians played Senate. There were three rows of 10 squares, the last five were always decorated. Now it's assumed this game was themed on the afterlife. Plus King Tut was buried with one of these boards, so that's definitely something to do with it. And there's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing Senate, so you know it was addictive. It looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. My palms are already so sweaty. Number eight, glamour. Makeup in ancient Egyptian culture was key. Not only did they wear makeup and smell good because they wanted to resemble the very gods they believed in, but makeup had a practical use as well in the daily life of a pharaoh. They believed makeup gave you protection from the gods Ra and Horus. They would put together these beauty kits by grinding down malachite and galena, and then they would create the substance called coal. There wasn't a lot of blending back then. Makeup was often applied directly to the skin using wood or bone. And it wasn't just the ladies as well. Men wore makeup and perfume. Of course, you gotta look good and smell good. Billy, like, have you seen them? What? I, I wanna wear some of this. They smell like beautifulness. They smell like the afterlife. They smell amazing. Egyptians believed makeup had healing abilities, and honestly, they weren't wrong. Makeup back then had enough lead in them, so eye infections would stay away, ideally. Number seven, Cleopatra's methods. Male rulers took the name Ptolemy and queens were Cleopatra. Her lineage runs deep in the heart of Egypt, but Cleopatra, fun fact, she was not actually Egyptian. She was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and after Alexander the Great's death in 323 BCE, Ptolemy then took over Egypt, which in turn launched this new wave, this dynasty of Greek rulers that lasted centuries. As Cleopatra got older, she was determined to learn Egyptian. And due to political structure, she started to style herself as the goddess Isis. And then in comes Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar had a history of his own, obviously, and his, rather than family and power, was filled more with, you know, lust, more than anything. He was known to sleep around and then use their power after doing the dirty. When these two crossed paths, history was never the same. In October of 50 BCE, Cleopatra had fled to Syria. Once there, she established an army and returned two years later to face her brother. Cleopatra knew that during this time, she needed all the support she could get, specifically now from the Romans. At the same time, Caesar was looking to collect debts from Cleopatra's father, so they both relied on each other in some way. It was a match made in heaven. Your most compatible has been updated. Right swipe. I would right swipe on Alexander the Great, for sure. I'd be like, who's this handsome man? Mm. Nicknamed Bald Adulterer. Okay, you know, he's trouble. Number six, King Tut. One of the greatest mysteries is, of course, the history of the young King Tut. The young boy became pharaoh at just age nine in 1332 BC, but during his time of ruling, the young king had to face a country in conflict. Egypt and Nubia were going head to head over land, and not even 10 years into ruling, the young pharaoh died at age 18. It wasn't until 1922 until he was seen again. Howard Carter discovered the tomb of the lost king, appropriately in the Valley of the Kings. This is where we could have been more careful here in history. Sure, it's exciting finding mummies and discovering your history and all that jazz, but when King Tut was discovered, they tried to move his body out of the oil that coated the coffin. But in doing so, they damaged him. So now it's next to impossible to tell what really took his life at such an early age. We have some ideas though, it's not entirely hopeless. It's believed right now that King Tut had a broken leg. After some 3D scans were done, it appears the king wasn't in the best shape prior. He may have fallen off of a chariot. So if Tut passed away at an early age, out of nowhere, this could mean another mystery is afoot. Number five, 
Space Knife. Only a few years after King Tut's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, archaeologist Howard Carter found two daggers that were buried with the king. Now, like I mentioned earlier, it's not uncommon to be buried with your treasure or belongings. It's why ancient Egyptians would build these tombs in a certain way, so grave robbers can't just sneak in after you pass away and then take all of your goodies. So two daggers were found with King Tut, one made of iron and the other with gold. Now, with iron being more rare than gold during the Bronze Age, this was quite a big deal. With recent advancements in technology, we're able to use a technique called portable X-ray fluorescent spectrometry, and according to the journal Meteorites and Planetary Science, the blade is actually made of iron, nickel, and cobalt, suggesting that its material is that of extraterrestrial origin. A blade fell from the sky, and now a king has it. That's pretty insane. Also, aliens? Just saying. Number four, KB-55. Also located in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise known as KB-55, was found by Edward Arton back in 1907. It was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb, and the reason that we call this tomb by a number rather than a name is because we really don't know for sure who's inside. Even the walls of the tombs inside, they aren't covered with beautiful hieroglyphs to tip us off on their history or their ruling, it's just bare. The only hint as to who is buried remains on the walls. It's one hieroglyph that remains, and it was discovered also in 1907, and it translates simply to, the evil one shall not live again. That's very scary. That's definitely scarier than Greg was here. I don't know. Even massive stones were built and set up in order to prevent anything from getting out, whereas usually with ancient tombs, it's the opposite, so that's pretty scary. The description for those inside the tomb has also been destroyed, so we have really no idea who's in KB-55, or what. <laughs> Number three, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens, and they look athletic. They look to be in great shape, when in reality, these pharaohs were probably quite obese. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day and you have baboons dancing around, plus a little dab of honey every, I don't know, eight minutes, yeah, you're gonna gain some weight. Many of these ancient pharaohs had diabetes. And Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong, but historians all agree that she was out of shape and extremely unhealthy. Honestly, I would do the exact same if I was there back then. She was ahead of her time. If somebody made a statue for me, I'd be like, yeah, give it an eight pack, make him extremely jacked in seven two. Can we do that? Sure, no one's gonna ask questions. I'm Dwayne The Rock Johnston, just, just write it down, please. Number two, worship cats. I am allergic to cats, but I still love them. I still pet them. I ruined my entire night just to get my face right there next to their cute little furry face. But ancient Egyptians, like I said earlier, really loved cats. They respected them, they worshiped them. Even though at the time dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. So if there's ever a cat versus dog argument going on on your end of the screen, cats win. I'm allergic and I'm still saying cats win. That's, that's huge. If you had a cat, it means you had good luck. When cats passed away, they too were mummified back in the day. You would think that alone was plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs went a step further. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and then mourn until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. Next time your friend tells you that their cat passed away, tell them that if they really love them, they'll shave their eyebrows off and then see what they say. Also, you don't have to make your friends shave their eyebrows. Let's leave this one in the past. That's fine. Just be sad with eyebrows. Be like, hmm. Number one, fight a hippo. Egypt's first pharaoh, Menes, although we know next to nothing about his history, there is something there that has historians scratching their heads to this day. At his early time, the pharaoh was setting out to unite all of Egypt under his rule. The time that he ruled as well is considered a rather peaceful time when comparing it to years later. We know that he was well respected, and we also know that after his 63 years of peaceful ruling, he was stomped to death by a hippo. That's horrible. It's a horrible way to go out. He was an elderly ruler at that time. He was surrounded by guards, and somehow a hippo got all the way to his chambers. A hippo! And then ended the pharaoh's life. Some suggest that the reason there's nothing written about this pharaoh's tragic, horrible demise is because it's possible that the hippo was his pet. This is why you don't try and tame a beast as a pet. Perhaps this was an early similar situation as the Siegfried and Roy tiger attack. Just stick to smaller magical cats. They're much safer. They won't stomp you to death. Oh my god, it's horrible. Guys, those were just 10 of the many mysterious things ancient Egyptian pharaohs did, from worshipping Milky Way dung beetles to showing up naked at somebody's front door. Those times were pretty wild. We're gonna start with the classic, Who's My Mummy? Around the year 1341 BC, a royal child 
child is born by the name of Tut Mahaten, the living image of Aten. Sometime after dad's death, Tut rebrands to Tut Mahan. This is because his dad is the legendary dumb. Akmahaten, who tries to force monotheism. Anyways, some scholars believe that Tut's mom was Ak's principal wife, Nefertiti, but others believe his mother was the secondary wife named Kia. But with either theory, we run into the issue that it's not entirely certain that Ak was even Tut's father, getting cheated on by both wives. That's when you know you're doing something wrong. It's quite possible that Tut's father was the pharaoh Sman Akhara. While DNA tests of several, while DNA tests of several mummies found in the Valley of Kings seem to indicate that Tut's father and mother are buried not far. Egyptologist Marianne Eaton Cross also points out that whereas these mummies are very clearly close relatives of Tut, it's actually difficult to establish precise familiar relationships using only DNA. Egyptian royal families like to preserve the bloodlines, so his mom could also biologically be his sister and cousin, and all of that would show up as an indecipherable mix that does nothing to confirm more than just a relation. If it is Nefertiti, the question remains, where's my mummy? In more recent years, speculation about King Tut tomb is that Queen Nefertiti, whose tomb and sarcophagus are long lost to us, is buried somewhere within. This claim is made by Egyptologist Nicholas Reeve, who realized that the cartouches depicting Tut had been buried by his pharaonic successor I had been painted over cartouches of Tut burying Nefertiti. Reeve said close inspection of I's cartouches reveal clear underlying traces of an earlier name, that of Tut. In its original version, this scene had shown Tut performing the funerary rite over the tomb's original owner, his immediate predecessor Nefertiti. The new evidence, specifically the north and east walls of the treasury being man-made structure whilst everything else is cut stone, does support the theory that Tut's tomb is only an outer section of a much larger tomb prepared for and still occupied by Nefertiti, whose own independent sequence of funerary chambers lies beyond. It would also add context as to why the king had such a small, oddly shaped burial chamber. But if someone does lay beyond those walls and it's not Nefertiti, then knock knock Who's there? Few scholars share Reeves' optimism that any new chambers contain Nefertiti's tomb. There's something about her specifically that fills archaeologists with dread and defeat like she's the popular hot girl at school who would never look at them. The desire to find her mummy is potent as it would be a tremendous discovery and greatly contribute to the study of ancient Egypt. Frank Rahil of the University of Zurich compiled a list of other royal relatives that he felt could be interred there, including Tut's older sister, Mary Hatton, his possible mother, Key, and of course, Smen Kahara. There is a belief, however, that if it is Smen, while Nefertiti died, Tut had her interred with him. Possibly because, as mentioned, the dude could be his dad, but also maybe Tut knew his mom loved this guy more than Ak. I don't know, I don't got time for ancient Egyptian Kardashian drama right now. All I'm saying is, is Tut could have cracked that tomb open, buried Nefertiti, closed it back up, and when he died, he got buried in the front most room. But to appeal to my ancient alien theorists, is it alien matter? On the flip side of Educated Leaps, we have alien conspiracy. Egypt's own antiquities ministry announced a few years ago that there were signs of extraterrestrial activity discovered after some radar scans of King Tut's tomb. The radar scans, according to French archaeologist Avril Sapp, refuted theories that Queen Nefertiti's tomb is hidden beyond that of King Tut, and instead revealed weird and extraterrestrial material appeared to resemble a body. However, both Sapp and unnamed antiquity officials refused to answer questions concerning whether or not it could be alien remains. But the AO did confidently boast they could not even come up with something like this in the National Treasure or Indiana Jones movies. This is revolutionary. We don't know what there is, but we've never seen results like this before, said Sapp, who coincidentally discovered dinosaur bones in the Pyramid of Giza a few years ago on April 1st, 2014. Whatever's inside of there could hold secrets to everything behind ancient Egyptian history and technology. Egypt will continue to conduct radar testings and scannings to determine how to enter the hidden chamber without damaging anything inside. Next Next on the roster, how do you die? One important question that's likely never going to be answered by anything that might be contained in newly discovered chambers is how Tut died. Let's run through some of the many options, shall we? Was it A, King Tut's knee was broken so badly that it was a compound, the bone piercing the skin and causing massive bleeding. Although a fatal leg fracture fits the idea that Tut had died abruptly, it cannot be stated for medical certainty that the fracture occurred while Tut was alive. It's possible his knee was broken after death. Was 
exit B. Tut's death was caused by an infection that resulted from said fracture. Not the result of a chariot crash by the way since Tut's physical impairments would have made chariot racing impossible. His immune system was weakened from several bouts of malaria. But maybe it was C. Tut may have been killed by an elderly chief advisor and successor I. An x-ray of his skull revealed calcified blood clot at the base and it could have been caused by a blow from a blunt instrument. Or maybe it's D. New analysis of CT scans from 03 show Tut was embalmed without his heart and anterior chest wall. Structures that couldn't have been removed by tomb robbers or anyone else. The assumed cause was an extensive crushing and tearing injury like the bite of a hippopotamus. But don't worry son, as long as you live, dad's gonna pick your career. Young men didn't get jack bleep in the way of choosing what they wanted from the day their little man got snipped. They were harassed about marriage by their mom incessantly and dad's always yelling at them for not holding the dandera flashlight in the right spot so he could see more properly. This is because once a man is viable for marriage, he needs to be prepared to support his partner. A father's rule became about teaching his son's living skill. Herodotus and Diodorus often refer to a hereditary calling in ancient Egypt. Not a system of rigid inheritance of a career, but an endeavor to pass on the father's function to his children. If dad teaches you glass blowing primarily, but also woodwork and butchering, then you're gonna start as a glass blower and use your time outside of it to learn and integrate into the trade you prefer more. Maybe it was butchering or woodwork, but maybe it was something different altogether. A son was commonly referred to as the staff of his father's old age. By mastering his father's trade before one of his own, at insured as dad ages, son can take care of the family business if it's more lucrative and supports his father better that way. By the way, for this reason, adoption was huge in Egypt. And once you're an adult with a family to support, you'll learn how currency was nightmarish. Up until the time of the Persian invasion in 525 BCE, the Egyptian economy operated on a barter system based on agriculture. The monetary unit of ancient Egypt was the Deben, and it was approximately 90 grams of copper. Expensive items could also be priced in Deben. So, like if a 75 liters of wheat cost one Deben, and then a pair of sandals also cost one Deben, it made perfect sense to the Egyptians that a pair of sandals could be purchased with a bag of wheat as easily as a chunk of copper. Even if the sandal maker had more than enough wheat, she would happily accept it in payment because it could be easily bartered in exchange for something else somewhere else. The most common item used to make purchases were wheat, barley, and cooking or lamp oil, but in theory almost anything would do. Beer was the most popular drink in ancient Egypt and was frequently used as compensation. The lower class of society produced the most goods used in trade and therefore provided the means for the entire culture to thrive. Even if it did mean going to the market required bringing just as many bags of things with you as you were going to leave with. And since I mentioned beer, life in Egypt would be impossible unless you liked liquor. Wages were paid primarily in grain. Thanks weird Egyptian currency system, just what I wanted to bring home after a 10 hour labor shift. A six pound bag of barley, which was then used to make the two staples of the Egyptian diet bread and beer. Beer was made from barley dough, so bread making and beer making happened simultaneous. Egyptians made a variety of beers of different strengths, which was calculated according to how many standard measures of liquid was made from one hecate of barley. Thus, beer of strength two was stronger than beer of strength 10. These divisions were made because there was no 100% clean drinking water, so everybody of all ages drank beer all the time. And what's beer caused? Bloating, weight gain, heartburn, liver issues, and if you're predisposed to any of these things and you have to spend your life drinking beer, make sure not to jump up and down, you're probably going to combust. But don't worry, if the beer has you feeling like crap, you definitely had access to laxatives 24-7. An investigation by the UK's University of Manchester and the Egyptian Medicinal Plant Conservation Project provided findings that laxatives were an accessible and normally product by ancient Egyptians. Doctors in ancient Egypt believed the human body should be regularly flushed out to prevent disease and clean the intestines, not just in times of illness. Many Egyptians took this advice and used castor oil to force waste out of their body. Figs, bran, and dates were also used as laxatives in ancient Egypt, and one ancient remedy to relieve excess gas and indigestion was cumin, a hefty portion of goose fat, and milk, boiled together, strained, consumed. Metcalf, a scientist in the Manchester University School of Medicine, adds that the Egyptian use of bowel stimulants such as the bitter fruit coxin and castor oil remained in clinical use until about 40 years ago, so the amount of crapping would have definitely made living in ancient Egypt crappy. And naturally, what's worse than being terrified to leave? Like the people of Mesopotamia, India, China, and Greece, ancient Egyptians lived in modest homes and apartments, raised families, and enjoyed their leisure time. A significant difference, however, is between Egyptian culture and that of other lands was that the Egyptians believed their land was intimately tied to their personal salvation, so they had a deep fear of dying beyond the borders of Egypt. A 
It was thought that the fertile dark earth of the Nile River Delta was the only area sac sanctified by the gods for the rebirth of the soul in the afterlife, and to be buried anywhere else would be to be condemned to non-existence. Those who served their country in arms or those who traveled for a living saved money and made provisions for their bodies to be returned to Egypt should they be killed. However, due to this belief, as we know Egyptians were not amongst the world's great travelers. There is no Egyptian Herodotus, Elvia Chalabi. Even in negotiations and treaties with other countries, Egyptian preference for remaining in Egypt ensured everyone had to come to them. Even within the confines of the country, people did not travel far from their places of birth, and most, except for times of war, famine, or upheaval, lived their lives and died in the same locale. It's believed that one's afterlife would be a continuation of one's presence. The yard and tree and stream you saw every day outside your window would replicate your afterlife exactly. So Egyptians were encouraged to live gratefully within their means and care for their environment and never leave. Kicking off the list at number 10, Ramses II. Ramses II, part two, you see what I'm doing here. He's considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. Ramses II is still considered the ruler of rulers. It's not a bad title, not bad at all. In year 30 of his reign, Ramses II was ritually transformed into an Egyptian god. Not bad, I'm turning 30 in a few years. I hope someone turns me into a god or gets me like a bike, <laughs> one of the two, I'll take both. So it was only fair that the spoiled pharaoh erected a bunch of statues of himself. Yeah, big selfies. Ramses put up more selfies than any other pharaoh in history. Most famous of them, the temples of Abu Simbel. There lies a monument dedicated to the late Queen Nefertiti and the Ramesseum. We kicked off a part one with Ramses signing the first ever peace treaty, so, so for part two we had to show some of the glamour side of him, you know? Number nine, over 100 children. Who is this guy, Nick Cannon? Ramses II is the father to over 100 children. Uh, with that, of course, came the you know 200 wives, otherwise ow and how, if it was just one person, ow and how, you know? <laughs> it's guesstimated that Ramses had 96 sons and 60 daughters. Of all those children, Ramses outlived a lot of them. It's almost like living as a king helped, perhaps, maybe, I don't know, maybe you ate better. Maybe, just a hint, just an idea. Eventually, Ramses was succeeded by his 13th son with his favorite queen, Queen Nefertari, giving her the fanciest tomb in the Valley of the Queens. Nefertari's tomb contains paintings that some consider are the greatest works of ancient Egyptian art. Not bad, I had like baseball wallpaper on mine growing up. Tomb QV66, he spoiled his lady, look at this. We gotta love him. Her tomb is 520 square meters covered in beautiful art, but in 1904 when Nefertari's tomb was rediscovered, all that was found was her mummified knees. Yeah, all that was left was her kneecaps. What, like, who does this? Raiders had stolen all the treasure prior, sometime in the many moons she had been lying there, and they even took her body and left her knees. Like, what? Monsters. They're like, yeah, grab the treasure, leave the patellas, let's do it. Number eight, ready to strike. Pharaohs may have looked beautiful living and after death, but they meant business, okay? They were protective of their land, their family, their many, many lovers and children. The symbol often worn by pharaohs were symbols of power, a Nemes crown. This crown was a striped headcloth and the back of their head was covered with an aureus symbol, aka an upside down cobra. The cobra symbol represents that the pharaoh is always ready and willing to attack their enemies, attack them with venom. It's a pretty cool symbol. Mine just says DC Etnies Shoes. I'm like, I don't, this says fight me, if anything. DC Skate Shop in my back. I'm like, yeah, you can just attack me, that's cool. Number seven, King Teddy. The Pyramid of Teddy was built for the first ruler of the sixth dynasty. While it's not as flashy or massive as other pyramids, inside it contains the oldest writing ever, in the religious world, that is. Inside it contains the pyramid texts, these legendary texts. They go all the way back to 2400 BC. The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this king, King Teddy, could ascend to the heavens after his death. This isn't bizarre behavior by any means, but King Teddy, he was specific. He wanted to be a star, like a literal star. There are spells and incantations that are in this tomb meant to free the king's soul as he arrives in the cosmos. More specifically for Teddy to become a star in the sky and join Osiris and Orion in the Hashtag God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to these heavens. It's one thing to be buried with your gold, then you can live another life, but to become a star? I need to expand my dreams, my gosh. King Teddy was onto something here. When I go in my will, I'm gonna be like, can I become a star, is that possible? Can I just throw me up into the heavens? Can I do that? Or bury me, that's cool. Bury me in Ajax, that works. <laughs> Number six, Yozer. For this one, we're looking into some bull worshiping. So if you're a fan of bulls, here, this one's perfect for you, weirdly enough. 
Just north of the Steppe Pyramid of Pharaoh Dozier, archaeologist August Mariette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapium. It's a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, and it's a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. This was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls, these bulls that were said to be sacred of course, and after their death they would become immortal. Immortal bulls, that sounds badass. And also terrifying, that's very scary. Don't wear red around these guys. Today at Saqqara there's a massive vault, it's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock, it's huge, and along the sides there's 24 chambers, each with a sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Just impossible craftsmanship all around. Especially at these times, like, oh my god, my wrists are tired just typing about this, let alone doing this. Inside these boxes were animal remains, bones and all that jazz, but back in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. You had to mummify them, right? Hence part one and where we are now. How are these tombs built so perfectly, weighing over 80 tons, and also, where do these bones come from? I have so many questions. Maybe on part three we'll answer them. Number five, we love cats. I'm allergic to cats, but I still go for it. I still pet them. I risk everything just to... Yes, I don't care. I ruined my entire weekend just to get my face all up in their whiskers. Nobody did it like ancient Egyptians. You've probably heard this at one point or another. They worshipped cats. They were like, you know, the legendary <laughs> cats. That was, that was their thing. I'm more of a golden retriever guy, but I get it. They're cute. They respected them. They worshipped them. Even though at the time, dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. It's because they just stare at shit randomly. Mid-conversation, a cat would just be like... No, they're not magical, they're terrifying. They're on something. If you had a cat, you had good luck, apparently. A friend of mine has two fat cats. He has some pretty good luck, I think. If they're fat, they're good? Hmm. When a cat passed away back in ancient Egyptian times, they too were mummified. You would think that alone was just plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs, they would obviously go a step further. Hence this fun list. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and would mourn them until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. That's, I, I got over my childhood animal in like six business days. It's not a bad thing, it's just that's a long time, you know? Next time your friend tells you their cat passed away, tell them if they really love them, they would shave their eyebrows. Test them. Number four, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens, well, all the pharaohs were considered kings, but it was equal at the time. And they all look athletic. They all look like these warriors, right? They look to be in great shape. When in reality, a lot of these pharaohs were probably pretty overweight or unhealthy. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day, plus a little dab of honey every eight minutes, you're gonna gain some weight. Yeah, that's how it goes. Many of these ancient pharaohs did have diabetes, and Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong and all that jazz, but almost all historians agree that she was out of shape and quite unhealthy. Honestly, fair. I would do the exact same thing. She was ahead of her time. If somebody was like, hey, I'm gonna make a statue for you. What should I make it look like? I'm like, no, yeah, give him an eight pack. Make him jacked. I don't know. Make him look like Michael Jordan. I don't know. Number three, gender reveal parties. Okay, we've seen all these videos online. A guy goes to swing and hit a baseball. He misses, it hits the ground. There's a big pink cloud of smoke. Everyone's like, oh my God. Gender reveal parties, right? They're pretty popular. Turns out they're popular back in ancient Egyptian days. But nobody did it like them. Also, nobody started any wildfires back then when any uh, ancient Egyptians did it, so that's nice. We should go take a note from them. Back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. You would have to use wheat and barley seeds. You would have to pee on them. And then, however it grew, that would determine the sex. I would feel bad. First of all, I'd be like, hi, we're curious. Don't mind us. I'm just gonna pee on your crops, sir. Let us know how it grows. We're really aiming towards a boy this time. We have 96 girls, so we're gonna try a couple of boys. Yeah, depending on how the crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. And it worked a lot of the time. It's pretty wild. We went from watering crops to burning them down just to find out a gender. Hashtag it's a boy. Number two, more tattoos. More tattoos for number two. We love it. You guys saw what I did. Ancient Egyptians worshipped animals. We talked about that, the whole cat stuff and the whole hippo situation in part one, that was violent. But what about baboons? Did they get any love? Baboons, I say it weird, baboons, baboons. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. One of the most strange things pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Yep, stop resisting, you're going to jail. Me and seven baboons, let's carry them into the car, bam. Imagine stealing food for your family just to like try and get by and four baboons pop out, start doing parkour and then arrest you in front of everyone. That'd be so embarrassing and also alarming. They train baboons to pick fruit, make beer and even entertain. 
Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party, apparently. If their dance moves alone would be reason enough to get a tattoo on one of my arms, honestly. Going all crazy, throwing their own at people, I'd be like, yeah, right here, or here, I don't care. And finally, number one, the afterlife. One of the most fascinating parts about these ancient Egyptian pharaohs is that they would pass away literally covered in gold, head to toe. It's nice to know that this long ago, some of these kings and queens still rest untouched by grave robbers or explorers. The afterlife for these pharaohs was important. And as soon as they take on the throne, work is immediately underway on their tomb. That's a little grim when you think about it. It's like, hey, congratulations, we're gonna start making where you're gonna be buried. It's like, thanks, I think. These monuments took time, but they were built to last, and clearly, they have. Pharaoh's eyes were painted black with coal. They did this so that they would look like the god Horus after they passed on. Mr. Unpopular, Xerxes I is number 10. Xerxes is one of two pharaohs on the list who wasn't actually Egyptian, and it ultimately puts Homi in some hot water. He ruled during the 27th dynasty whilst Egypt was a part of the Persian Empire, having the throne from 486 to 465 BC. These Persian kings were acknowledged as a pharaoh despite not being Egyptian, so Xerxes the Great, as he was known, earns a place on our list by virtue of fame. He wasn't so great to the Egyptians though. He had a disregard for their traditions and religious beliefs and allocated funds away from their temple. He also banged his niece and gave her the robe that his wife had made for him, so his wife had her sister-in-law mutilated as revenge. It was this whole big scandal. But it caused Xerxes brother to try and usurp him, something that Xerxes was already dealing with constantly as back at home in Babylonia, as well as in Egypt, people were trying to steal the throne away from him, causing him to ping pong back and forth between the two places. When he wasn't doing that, Xerxes was failing disastrously at trying to invade Greece. Eventually the embarrassment of his consistent failure to do so and the endless coup attempts on him was a bit too much and Xerxes abandoned the Egyptian throne. His failed attempts to invade Greece ensured that his portrayal by Greek historians and by extension the film 300 hasn't been very kind. Number 9 is a famous hussy, Ramses II. This man could not keep it in his pants. Sure, 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 he was the greatest leader of the 19th dynasty and an amazing tactical mind and made Egypt prosperous, blah blah. He's the son of Seti the first, and Ramesses went on to declare himself a god and the ruler of Egypt for 67 years before dying of natural causes at 90, which is an insane number for an era where the life expectancy was 30. But homeboy was not a modest pharaoh by any means. He was a lying two-faced politician who based his entire campaign on a laundry list of fabrications. The extensive architectural legacy of his reign are thought to have left the throne close to bankruptcy at the time of of his death. Before getting to that ripe old age, as mentioned, Ramesses spent any free time he had banging, enough to sire between 100 to 200 children in his lifetime. He even outlived 12 of his sons. Ramses was one of the first rulers to take on the title of the Great before it was cool. All in all, he was pompous and spoiled. He left behind more statues of himself than any other person in the history of the world. He was obsessed with outshining all those who came before him, and he would tower over all those that would follow. Speaking of testament to ego, number eight is Khufu, the son of Seneferu, which I'm probably butchering, who is the first pharaoh to build pyramids. Khufu was on a one-upping mission since day one. He commissioned the Pyramids of Giza, one of the last standing seven wonders of the ancient world, which by the way we learned not too long ago is lopsided. The pyramid was originally covered in white limestone adorned with gold and since stripped away by greedy tourists over the last 4,000 plus years. He used his platform to also establish mining and trade from what's now modern day Lebanon. Unfortunately, while he brought greatness to Egypt in ways of infrastructure and economy, socially he inspired a lot of mixed reviews due to his use of forced labor and a dismissive nature. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus was a particular critic, depicting Khufu as a vicious tyrant who used slaves to build his great pyramid. Now, many Egyptologists believe that these claims are merely defamatory, guided by the Greek viewpoint that such structures could only be built through greed and misery. If those rumors are true, then Khufu had high expectations and forced labor and no one liked him. If they're not, then he wasn't a bad guy at all. Number seven is Cambyses, the animal hater. This this is the other Persian pharaoh on our countdown, and he too enjoyed picking on the Egyptians he ruled, but in a very indirect way. See, Cambyses enjoyed watching animals suffer. It's said in his spare time he put on fights between lion cubs and puppies and made his wife watch as they tore each other apart. In fact, nearly every story coming out of Egypt at the time of his rule told about Cambyses involved him ruining the life 
of one animal or another. Early on, he went to see Apis, the bull that Egyptians treated as a god. Right in front of the priests dedicated to Apis, he pulled out a dagger and just started stabbing the bull until it died, laughing at them and saying, This is a god worthy of the Egyptians. What a prick. Number 6 is Menkuar, the pharaoh who refused death. Even though the title of pharaoh calls them undying and the pyramids are built to take them to the afterlife, you can't blame a person for still being fearful of what happens after they close their eyes for the last time. 25th century BC pharaoh Menkuar is the poster boy for that fear. An oracle once came to him and reportedly told him he only had 6 years left to live. Menkuar was terrified and decided to do everything he could to avoid it, even fool the gods. His biggest plan revolved around the idea that as long as night never came, a new day could never start. If a new day doesn't begin, time couldn't pass, so he couldn't die, right? Right. Anyways, on this basis, for the rest of his life, he lit up all the lamps he could and convinced himself it was always daytime. He would not sleep and force countless serfs to suffer with him this way. Every night, he stayed up drinking and celebrating the success until the day he died, because the gods will always have the last laugh. Number five, Queen Nefertiti's resting place. So yes, on one hand, 3D scanning technology is vital when it comes to these ancient sites. We're able to figure out King Tut's medical issues from thousands of years ago. It's impressive. It's great, but thanks to this new technology, we're also finding hidden chambers in these tombs as well. Another theory surrounding the queen, the lost queen Nefertiti, is that King Tut's chamber was actually meant for her. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this at all. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. But, but King Tut passed away at age 19, so many believe that his own burial chamber at that point wasn't even built yet. So instead, they had to use hers, they had to improvise. A radar survey conducted around the tomb in the Valley of the Kings shows us a possible hidden chamber, right behind the north wall of the burial chamber. We still haven't found her final resting place, but perhaps this recent 2021 discovery of an ancient city will hold us off until then. Look at this, we missed this on the news. Where was all this? Crazy. Number four, a fake beard. Not really unusual considering the times, but this is definitely worth a mention. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, and there were only just a few that were women in total. But during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. This was her goal, this was her vision. The pharaoh fake beard, massive muscles, historians believe this was done as an act of politics. It was done on purpose to make a point. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson then took the throne, Thutmose III. And then he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Number three, no more religion. This was a huge deal in ancient Egypt, rightfully so. The pharaoh Akhenaten thought it would be a great idea to just end multiple religious beliefs. Yep, just uh, stop. Okay, now we just do the one. Traditional Egyptian culture would believe in multiple gods, but this pharaoh couldn't keep up, so he convinced everybody to believe in just one god, Aten. Well, only days after his passing, the people of Egypt said, screw that, we're gonna go back to multiple beliefs. That was working a lot better for us, thank you, sir. And then also, we're destroying every piece of evidence that involves you for trying that nonsense. Yeah, temples, cooking pots, anything with his image, gone and ideally forgotten. It wasn't until the 19th century when we realized this pharaoh once ruled. Number two, hippo problems. Do you have any idea how fast hippos are in real life? I had no clue my entire life. They're really fast, they fly at you, they're like dinosaurs. Hippos can run as fast as 50 kilometers an hour. Yeah, I'll just lead with that. Pharaoh Menes was Egypt's first pharaoh ever, so it felt fitting to include some pet problems in our list. We don't know much about the lost pharaoh because, well, for starters, he was alive a very long time ago, 3000 BC, that's where we're talking. But what we do know for certain is that King Menes ruled over Egypt during a peaceful time, and he was stomped to death by a hippo. It's literally how his history.com says it, in that order. This king spent over 60 years on the throne, and a hippo got him. I don't think there's a harder way to go out, honestly, in my opinion. It's a mystery still, thousands of years later, but look at zoos today. I don't know, maybe a hippo didn't like living like a king. Maybe he wanted to live like Shrek and just splash around and be dirty. He's an animal. He's literally a hippo, you know? And finally, coming in at number one, a renewed passport. I'll be honest, right now, I currently have no idea where my passport is. Chris, do you know where yours is? Yeah. Wow, we have an adult here. Wow, an adult, that's lovely. I always panic and search for it 13 hours before a flight. I am the worst to travel with. Passports are important, obviously, and they're a pain in the ass 
to replace. But did you know you can still get one even if you've been dead for, I don't know, thousands of years? There's a fun fact. Pharaoh Ramses II, one of ancient Egypt's greatest rulers, got a passport back in 1974. Yeah, you heard me. After being exhumed and put on display for so long, it was decided it's time to send the lost king off to Paris to get, you know, a little touched up being dead that long and all. Now obviously you're not gonna list this pharaoh as luggage, that's so rude. So the Egyptian government gave Ramses II his own official Egyptian passport for his commute. On the passport he had his age, his occupation, king obviously, and in case it wasn't clear, it was stated that the king too was deceased. Anyone who's seen the mummy can obviously, you know, relax at that point. Yeah. 